يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله ادى الامانه وبلغ الرساله ونصح للامه وكشف الغمه وتركنا على الحجه البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها الا هالك فعليه افضل الصلاه وتم التسليم وعلى اله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته الى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين اوصيكم ان تتقوا الله عز وجل وقد امرنا بالحق وقال تعالى يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون وقال تعالى يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا وقال تعالى يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ثم ما بعد we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we bear witness that none has the right to be worshiped or unconditionally obeyed except for him subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask him to send his peace and blessings upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam his family his companions and those that follow until the day of judgment and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst them Allahumma amin dear brothers and sisters it's no secret that when you look around the world today um, the state of the world is is pretty depressing it's very easy to become overly pessimistic and to say that you know what we've reached the end of time and i'm sure that there were times in the past where many people thought that the end of time had come that yawm al qiyamah that the day of judgment was right around the corner in fact what we see today that's happening for example in palestine in palestine we might think to ourselves that this is something that's unprecedented but we forget that there was a time where no adhan or iqama was made in Masjid al-Aqsa for 96 years. We might look at the situation of Syria and think to ourselves that this is something that's never happened before. We've never seen this much oppression in Syria in history. This must mean the end. And we might be forgetting that in the year 1066, one of the greatest massacres in history in Ma'awa took place in the name of the Crusades where people were burned alive and people were eaten. Um, even their dead flesh and their corpses, they were consumed by the Crusaders. We might look at Iraq and we might think to ourselves that this is the worst that we've ever seen in Iraq. But if we look in history, we'll find that what the Mongols did to Iraq is far greater than, what, you know, than any level of oppression we've ever seen in Iraq. And it can go on and on. You know, throughout the world, you can see the depressing situations that we see today. We find that there were times in history that were far greater in terms of oppression, in terms of injustice, um, in those same areas. And you know, it's, it it can make us very depressed, and it can make us very pessimistic, and it can make us do two things. One of them is it can make us become complacent with our situation and say that you know what, there is no point in trying to contribute to a better world because the world is over with anyway. And that's where the Prophet ﷺ said, And in one narration, he said, And they're both authentic narrations. Then whoever says that the people are done for, that people are helpless, that people have perished, he is the most hopeless of them. He is the, he is the one, in one narration, he is the most helpless and hopeless of them. In another narration, he is the one that's causing the people to be hopeless because of his pessimistic tone. That's one thing. The other thing is that people can say that, you know what, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing this to happen? Why is Allah allowing the injustice to happen in Egypt that we see today? The massacre that we saw in Rabia. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing the, the massacre in Syria? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing the oppression in Ethiopia, in Somalia, in Burma, in, in China? Why is this all happening? And that's a question that we first need to ask ourselves. You know, there's, there's a saying that I wanted to ask God why He allows injustice and oppression and poverty, but I was afraid He might ask me the same question. 
The idea is why do you allow injustice and poverty? Why do you allow dhulm? As a human being, why do you allow transgression on your watch, in your capacity, in your community, in your family, in yourself? Why do you allow injustice and why do you allow transgression? Because the Salaf, the, the pious predecessors, they used to say something very powerful. They used to say that we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from being left to ourselves. Oh Allah, save us from ourselves. Save us from the evil of ourselves. Because if we are left to ourselves, then the amount of injustice, the amount of transgression that can come from the human being is not surpassed by any other being. And subhanAllah, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the people, the Muslims, as they were first brought together, Remember the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. If you were enemies, you were at each other's throat. I mean, you were all trying to kill each other. And this is in regards to al Quraysh, this is in regards to the Ansar. The Ansar, the greatest group of people, you know, those people that hosted the Prophet and his companions, took them in and supported Islam at its most vulnerable time. You know, there were only three of the Ansar that were over the age of 40 because they all killed each other. All of their fathers had killed each other. You know, because of tribalism and things of that sort. And this group of people, this young group of people that was so used to war amongst themselves, that was so used to the tribalism that led them to kill each other, not only were they forced to be brought together, but at the same time they were forced to allow a completely, you know, a strange group of people from Mecca, the Muhajirin, you know, a completely immigrant community to come into their homes, to give them half of their homes, half of their wealth, and to support them with their lives. People that they didn't even know. That's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, remember the blessing of your Lord. When you were enemies, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala joined your hearts. And so through that blessing, you became brothers. You know, imagine, that, that's, what, that's what Islam did for those people. These were, you know, some of them were the most unjust and cruel human beings. You look at Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Before Islam, the injustice that used to come from Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Some of it is made up and some of it is real. You know, some of it, so for example, the story of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu burying his daughter alive, that's fabricated, doesn't exist. Umar radiallahu anhu had three daughters by the time he became Muslim. He was named Abu Hafsa. So he didn't kill any of his daughters, but at the same time, there is no doubt that he was the flag bearer of tribalism in his time. You know, he was someone who says about himself that he used to beat his slaves until he would become tired from beating them. The amount of injustice that used to come from Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala After Islam, this man becomes known, till the end of time he will be known as the flag bearer of justice. Even by all secular standards, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu did things in terms of justice or upheld justice in a way that was not seen before or after Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu except by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This man who used to beat his slaves tirelessly is the same one who has a statement of his in the United Nations Charter that how can you enslave a man that was born free? This man that used to beat his slaves tirelessly after becoming after becoming Muslim, and after becoming the Khalifa, and after becoming a man who upheld justice, not only in the Muslim world, but all over the world. When he hears about a person from Egypt, the son of Amr bin al-As, who lashed a person who was not Muslim, because he lost the race to him. He was racing with a Christian, and at the end of the race, he took his whip and he lashed him. And he said, I am the son of the noble one. I am the son of Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu. No, this is not Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu. And this man, this Christian man that was lashed, can come to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. All the way from Egypt to Medina. And can say that this person lashed me in the name of his father. What are you going to do about it? What does Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu do? Umar ibn Khattab doesn't give him some money and, and give him give him an official apology on behalf of the Muslims. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu summons the man and his father from Egypt, brings them to a Medina, 
to stand in front of the one that he lashed and tells the man, take back your revenge. You can lash the man and you can put the whip on the head of his father too. And he said, why would I do it on the head of his father too? He said, because he lashed you in the name of his father. SubhanAllah. I mean, this person becomes a standard of justice. Economic justice, going through the streets, making sure that there is no one who is not fed properly, that there is no one who is being oppressed, that there is no one who is going to sleep hungry in, under, under his ummah, within his ummah. This person who used to oppress after Islam, now Umar al-Khattab ta'ala is the one that when famine strikes and there is no meat, in Am al-Ramadah, in what's called the year of ashes, when people were being prayed on in the dozens, when there, were, when there was janazah after every salah for dozens of people because people were starving to death. And Umar al-Khattab himself almost dies because he refuses to eat while the ummah does not eat. And in fact, he changed colors of the Allah Ta'ala. And as the Sahaba used to say that we knew that if that year would have extended beyond it by, by even a day that Umar was going to die. And he says about himself, how can I call myself a shepherd? And I'm not going to be afflicted with what my, with, with what my flock is afflicted with. There's no way that I can be considered the shepherd of this flock if the flock is afflicted with that which I'm not afflicted with. This same man used to worry about a donkey in Iraq complaining against him on the Day of Judgment. This same man used to worry about his son having a piece of watermelon while the children of the Ummah were starving. This same man looked to the Kaaba as they would change the cloth of the Kaaba every single year and says that no, the children of the Ummah are more worthy of being clothed than the Kaaba. Because Rasulullah said that the honor of the believer is greater than the honor of the Kaaba. The blood of the woman is more sacred than the Kaaba. So it's more important that the children of the Ummah have clothes on them than the Kaaba. SubhanAllah, I mean look at this complete paradigm shift in his mentality and the mentality of the Ummah. This understanding amongst them. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, brought to the Ummah very early on within the revelation. It's not that the Prophet eased them into this understanding of justice and the importance of social justice. Rasulullah <laughs> from the very beginning is receiving these revelations. When the young girl who's buried alive will be asked, for what crime were you killed? Why were you killed? What was the excuse for taking your life? Economic injustice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns the people that cheat with the weights. All of this takes place within the early days of Islam, within the early days of revelation. Because theology is cheap without social justice. Theology is cheap without social justice. In fact, theology can become harmful if there is no social justice. Why is that? Because a person, and we know this, and this is the biggest problem that we have sometimes when we're looking at the world and we see what's going on in Egypt and we say, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Or we see what's going on all over the world, all of the different oppressors, and we say, look at these people. They're disgusting. But the problem is, is that many times we're focused on the TV and we're not looking in the mirror. What about you and I? What about your lul? What about your share of transgression and your share of oppression? What have you done to contribute to the problem? You know, what have you done to hurt, to hurt someone else? It's very important for us to look at ourselves. And unfortunately, many times we're able to completely separate our faith from that concept. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi, and this is the authentic hadith from Abu Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, hadith Qudsi, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa narrates this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, O oh my servants, Ya ibadi, inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi, I have forbidden oppression upon myself. What else does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that for? I've forbidden it for myself, I've made it haram for myself. And I've made it between you prohibited. I've, I have not allowed transgression or oppression between you. So do not oppress one another. Do not wrong one another. This is a very profound hadith. You know why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us something about the attitude and the mentality of dhulm. When you oppress someone or when you wrong someone, 
there is this, this intoxication with power that you have. You know, it's, it's interesting because that same word, those same words, I remember when, uh, whenever uh, one of the senators, the U.S. senators went to Egypt and they visited with, with the general, the Sisi over there, and he said he's intoxicated with power. And Imam ibn al-Qayyid rahimahullah said that a Zalim is intoxicated with his power. He thinks that he has power, and therefore he feels like he's not being held accountable. So he says to himself, hey, I can do whatever I want. Who's going to tell me no? Right? I'm in a position where I can harm this person. This person can't tell me anything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Inni haramtu dhulma ala nafs. Look, no one is more capable of harming anyone else than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the creation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade it for himself, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest of great. And we are the lowest of lowest creation. We're human beings. There is no comparison between our status and the status of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuses. Allah azza wa will not wrong anyone. Not in this dunya, in this world, or in the akhirah. Even, in, even the disbelievers on the day of judgment will not be wronged. Jaza al wifaqa. They will have exact compensation for what they did. They only get what they deserve. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to wrong anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow his anger to cause him to become unjust. Because the first rule on the day of judgment is la dhulmunyam. There is no oppression today. It's not going to be allowed. And subhanAllah, we have to ask ourselves about that. On the day of judgment, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbade dhulm for himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we need to be aware of that, will hold each and every single one of us accountable for the transgression that we committed against His servants and against His creation. Even the transgression of a human being against an animal. The Prophet ﷺ told us about a person, a woman that enters hellfire, because she forbids a, a, she forbids a cat from water. You know, subhanAllah, she, she forbids this cat from its, from its sustenance. And that's enough to enter her into hellfire. Whereas Rasulullah ﷺ tells us about a prostitute, you know, you're talking about a major sinner here, a prostitute that is entered into Jannah because she gives water to a thirsty dog. SubhanAllah, look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds the standard. This major sin is forgiven for a minor good deed. That's something that's very significant because that shows you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created us to harm one another. And if that's the level with an animal, then what about between human beings? And there are discrepancies sometimes, we might say there's a discrepancy in status. And that's the problem, that again, sometimes we become intoxicated with our power. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, when he once walked by a man that was beating his slave, Rasulullah ﷺ said to him, Allah is more capable of doing that to you. You know, you think that you're in a position of power right now, which is causing you to do that, but Allah is more capable of doing that to you. And the man said, I, Ya Rasulullah, I freed him. I freed him. And Rasulullah said, Had you not freed him, you would have been of the people of Hellfire. SubhanAllah. Why? Because you thought in that moment, there's some kibir there, there's a sense of pride there. You thought in that moment that you were in a position to do that. SubhanAllah. I mean, and that's why, by the way, a lot of times we're not able to defend our faith properly. You know, when people say Islam did not, do, did not abolish slavery, Islam, the Islam limited slavery, the word slavery, which is again an improper usage because when we think of slavery, we think of the, the horrible things that we've been exposed to or that we've, that we've read about. And we say Islam did not abolish slavery, Islam limited it to prisoners of war. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited a person from calling a prisoner of war a slave. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited a person from feeding him anything different than you would feed your own children, clothing that person with anything different than what you would clothe your own children. And the Prophet ﷺ said that if you hit that person, then the only expiation, the only kafara is to free them. Now you ask someone who's in Guantanamo Bay, or you ask someone who's in Abu Ghraib or in any of the torture cells in the Middle East that are, by the way, run by Muslim governments, would you rather be in that situation or would you rather be in that situation? The idea here again is that a person thinks that they're in a position of power. Therefore I can harm. Therefore I can do what I want. Now when we come to our own dealings and what we have, this is really, the, this is really what we need to ask ourselves. 
If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls me to account on the day of judgment and makes me face the people, will I or will will I, will I or will I not survive that questioning between people, that reckoning between people? Because it, it, you know, if we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even with major sins, then Allah Azza wa Jal is merciful enough to forgive us. And we, of course, there's a need for tawbah and istighfar. But wallahi, as Imam Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah said, I wish that on the day of judgment, the only one that would ask me is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That would be amazing if the only one that asks you on the day of judgment is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of his rahmah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as far as the servants are concerned, the ibad are concerned, the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala around you. You know, think about this. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, Atadruna man al muflis do you know who the bankrupt person is? They said, Ya Rasulullah, the one who has no money. The Prophet said, No, it's a person who comes on the day of judgment. They have their salah, they have their siyah, they've got their salah, they've got all the all the essentials, all the outward acts of worship are parents. But he hit this person, he cursed this person. He backbited that person. He slandered that person. And each and every single one of those people comes on the Day of Judgment and takes the, his share of good deeds away from him. Takes his salah. And imagine a person who's lived as an adult. How many Ramadans he's fasted? How many prayers he must have prayed? Maybe he witnessed Laylatul Qadr, his zakah, his sadaqah, all of his charity. And Rasulullah says that the people will take his good deeds until he runs out of all of his hasanat. He's completely deprived of good deeds. And then when he says that I have no more good deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes those people to take their sins off of their burden and put it on his back. Think about that. That's very dangerous. That's very dangerous because it shows you again, dear brothers and sisters, if we are guilty of dhulm in our workplaces, in your business, and let's face it, when it comes to our money, you know, woe to those who cheat with weights. A lot of times we might think to ourselves, and if I could ask the brothers to please come forward, inshallah ta'ala, many times we might see people, you know, we say we want to do business with Muslims. Every Muslim wants to do business with Muslims, and many times we regret that. Right? Because you start doing business with a Muslim and you say, MashaAllah, I see this brother all the time. He's a sweet brother, sweet sister, MashaAllah. This is someone I can do business with. Then when you deal with money, MashaAllah quickly turns into inshaAllah. And then we'll pay you back one day. Oh brother, but this and this and this and that. Everything changes. What happened? Because you get taken advantage of sometimes. It's sad. It's a sad state of affairs. That, you know, and, and one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ told us is the signs of the Day of Judgment. That trust will be lost. Trust will be will be lost. And one of the greatest the greatest form of trust actually is leadership, the trust of leadership. And then trust amongst people is lost. There's no sense of amana anymore. And that's why the Imam al-Shaybani rahimahullah ta'ala, Abu al-Hassan, the great scholar, uh, the student of Imam Hanif rahimahullah ta'ala, who wrote al mafsut who wrote the, the encyclopedia of Hanafi fiqh, one of the two greatest students of Imam Hanif rahimahullah ta'ala. And he was known for his writing in fiqh, but he was known for his lectures in Teskia. He used to always speak about spirituality and purifying the self. And he was asked, how come you never wrote spirituality in Teskia? And amrad al-qulub and the diseases of the heart and so on and so forth. And he said, I have written a book on Teskia. I have written a book on spirituality. And they said, what is that? And he said, I wrote Kitab al -Buyur. The book of money, the book of transactions. That's a book of Teskia, because if you can deal with your money in an honest way, then you have a pure heart. If you deal with your money in a, in a dishonest way, then your heart is not pure. Then there's an issue with you. There's something on the inside. Because as al Qurtubi rahimahullah ta'ala said, man loves money more than he loves his own children. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks about sacrifice, he speaks about al amwal of the awlad Money before children. Man will sacrifice his children for his money. And in fact, he loves money more than he loves himself. Strive with your with your money and with yourselves. Why? Because as Imam Qutbullah said, we love money more than we love ourselves. So you want to show your honesty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Deal in a halal way. Deal in a halal way. Earn halal and spend halal. Earn halal and spend halal. 
You know, or, or else you're telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I can do the salah stuff, but this stuff is too hard. And that's why they say, put your money where your mouth is. If you're a bottom of your money, then what good will that do for you on the day of judgment? Will that one dollar be worth any good deed on the day of judgment? On the day when Rasulullah Rasul tells us that there will be people that will be missing just one good deed. There will be one good deed short on the scale. Will that dollar in dunya, that extra dollar, be worth any of that? No, it's not going to be worth it. And if I'm worried about the bottom, you know, the transgressor, the oppressor of a country, then what about my own home? If I'm a person who oppresses his spouse, if I'm a person that thinks that because my spouse is afraid of me, I can hit that spouse, I can verbally abuse that spouse, what is that going to do for me on the Day of Judgment? And Imam Al-Qutayb, he said, and this is in Kitab Ibn Al-Akhbar, he said that there was a person, a sheikh, a scholar amongst us, who used to speak, and when he would speak, the people would be brought to tears. Everyone would cry. I mean, he was a very good speaker. He was a very eloquent speaker. And people considered him to be amongst the sincere. But the day when he was being buried at his janazah, a woman came and started to curse him and started to ask Allah to punish him. And we told her, Oh, 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 servant of Allah, Ya Allah, oh, oh, servant of Allah, you know, fear Allah. Why are you saying this? And she said, That's my husband. His own wife was coming and cursing him on the day of his janazah. And Ibn Qutayb says, Wallahi, we found his manbar covered in najasa and filth when we went back to the masjid. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it apparent to us. If you're a bottom in your own home, a transgressor in your own home, what good is it going to do for you on the day of judgment? If you're complaining about someone overseas, what about your own home, dear brothers and sisters? And so I leave you before I sit to contemplate this hadith. Ittaqul dhul, fear dhul, as the Prophet said, fear transgression. Because verily, fa'inna dhulma, verily, transgression on the day of judgment is dhulumat. Darkness upon darkness upon darkness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us, to protect us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who enjoy justice and compassion with their parents, with their families, with their wives, with their children, with their communities, with their societies and who speak up and make dua for those who are being oppressed all over the world. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our prayers and to alleviate the stress and the oppression from our brothers and sisters all over the world. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum wa nisaq al muslimin fa astaghfiru inna huwa al-mafur rahim. He didn't say, I'm the messenger of Allah, just move on. 
even the Prophet went to the man and told him, this young man, and said, go ahead and poke me back. Take your revenge. You know what the young man said to the Messenger He said, Ya Rasulullah, my shirt was off and you're wearing a shirt. SubhanAllah, you're trying to humiliate the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Now imagine if you and I were witnessing that. You know, we would, we, would be an out, we would be outraged. How dare you talk to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that way? And you know what? Usaid says the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to the man and he lifted his shirt. This youth and told him, go ahead and take your revenge. And the young man then kissed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, Ma aratu illa hadha ya Rasulullah. I didn't want except for this, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. SubhanAllah. It's a beautiful story, but you know what? The fact that the Prophet وسلم, even the Prophet وسلم, feared that perhaps he wronged that person, that perhaps he transgressed should really make you and I fear. If that was the Prophet of Allah, and this was just a young man, then what about the dhulm that we might have committed towards our parents? What about our spouses who bear us children? What about our children even? What about the people around us? What about our brothers and sisters who, when they say salamu alaykum to us, they expect when we say wa alaykum as salam that we mean wa alaykum as salam, peace be with you also. What about our brothers and sisters? What about humanity? And so, dear brothers and sisters, we need to fear dhulm the way the Prophet ﷺ feared dhulm, if not more, because none of us have the good deeds of the Prophet ﷺ. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our transgressions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who leave this world not having harmed anyone. And Imam al-Shafi rahimahullah said, and just contemplate on this, dear brothers and sisters, as you go home today. Verily, uh, you know, glad tidings to the one who dies and his sins die with him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when we leave this world, we have not harmed a single human being. And that if we harmed anyone, that we have secured their forgiveness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who, who stand on the day of judgment purified, having shown mercy and having mercy shown to them. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help our brothers and sisters all over the world. <laughs> وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لا تكوننا من الخاسرين اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم اغفر لوالدينا رب ارحمهما كما ربنا صغار ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم اغفر المستضعفين في مشارق الأرض ومغاربها اللهم أصلح أحوال إخواننا المنكوبين في مشارق الأرض ومغاربها اللهم عليك بأعدائك أعداء الدين اللهم أرنا فيهم عجائب قدرتك اللهم أهلك الظالمين بالظالمين وأخرجنا وأخواننا من بينهم سالمين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء بالقربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم واشكروه على نعماء يزد لكم ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأخير الصلاة